the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. Too many people want to listen to great content like this and lots of other of your other episodes, I'm sure, that have been fantastic. But they essentially want to just feel good about it. And honestly, you're not going to grow your business if you don't take action and you don't put yourself in a situation where it could be a bit uncomfortable to grow. So my tip is uh, go and take action. Run your law firm the right way. This is the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up, Jimmy? Tyson, how are you, my friend? It's good to good to see you and talk to you. I'm good, man. Good to see you. It's it's We've been busy lately. Lot, lots of things going on with Maximum Lawyers, so it's it's a it's an exciting time for us. For sure, and I'm also excited to welcome our guest today. His name is Ali Bilson, and he is a, a big time entrepreneur and marketing guy that I met at Traffic and Conversion in San Diego. He he spoke on um, running a uh, small event um, for members of his group, and he he taught me a lot that I think we're going to be able to implement in the in the conference. He's worked a lot with GKIC, with Infusionsoft. He's been around for a really long time. Uh, his website is www.oliverbilson.com. Ali, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Hey, Ali. So your, the, your homepage of your website says, let Ali Bilson uncover hidden opportunities in your business. So tell people what that means and what you do and a little bit about your journey. Sure. So um, I have kind of a an interesting kind of uh, start, I suppose, is I uh, I actually have never worked for anybody. I, I started my first business when I was uh, 15 years old, They're building custom computers and eventually exporting them and servicing people over in the Far East, actually in uh, Egypt, which is a really weird thing uh, to happen. Uh, but uh, it happened nevertheless. And that was kind of my start into running my own business. and. Um, uh, ultimately getting to where I am now. So, you know, since then we've, I've been fortunate enough to have built um, uh, multiple different businesses in different niches. And so at this point I've built five separate seven figure businesses of my own uh, from bricks and mortar consulting, a marketing agency, and also an international franchise. And all of it's been self-funded and um yeah, we've been lucky and, and, you know, it hasn't been a bed of roses, as you can imagine, on the way. It never is. Um, but um, I'm proud that we've, you know, uh, what we've done and, and where we've got to in terms of our portfolio of different businesses, uh, most of which have been grown, obviously, very aggressively. Ali, you obviously don't know this, but Tyson and I sort of thought up Maximum Lawyer at a GKIC event. I've learned a lot from Dan Kennedy and um Bill Glazer, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your time with them and how you were able to help them out. Yeah, sure. So it's actually quite funny. Um, at this point now, I, looking back, um, it's quite amazing that most of the people that I help are people who I initially learned from. So if I cast my mind back to when I was, uh, I just turned 19 years old, and at that time I was um, running a business which was in the automotive sector we were um, 
training people how to start their own window tinting business. Okay, so it was kind of like a biz op. And um, I really knew nothing about marketing at that time. I just thought that the, you know, just the fact that you offered a really quality service meant that it would constitute you getting customers, which as we all know, doesn't at all. Um, and so I picked up a, a book, which was The Ultimate Sales Letter by Dan Kennedy um, on my way out to a holiday, to a vacation. And I uh, went through this book uh, and it, it really spoke to me from uh, an introduction to direct response, which, you know, was completely new to me. We were running advertising um, all over the country at that time nationally, and we weren't really having great success with it. And we, we had this sort of approach of just um, really brand based advertising. And so when I was introduced to these principles of direct response and, and the, the heritage of those going back to direct marketing, I was really sold on that concept and I thought there's no other way to really build a business and everything we do going forward is, you know, I'm going to be a student of marketing, a student of direct response and um, implement a, as hard and fast as I possibly can. So I did that um, and really became an, I, I guess, quote unquote, like an expert in the fact that I had a lot of great results. One of the businesses we grew through a lot of Dan Kennedy and, and Bill's um education uh, from zero to 170 franchisees internationally in just less than four years um and i applied these principles to other businesses as well to a point where we sort of built this um direct response powerhouse i guess inside of our business we had this internal capability that i'd built and um you know it wasn't long before people started asking questions of how i'd done that and you know, this now was my second seven figure business that I built. And so, you know, it was, you know, people were asking some questions and we weren't really doing it for, for, for other people. I'd done a bit of ad hoc consulting for people. And um, and then one day, um, I think it was Darcy from GKIC at that time. I was an Infusionsoft user in the one of the first Infusionsoft users in the UK at this point we're sort of like 12 years in or so and um, she said look you know we're running this automated webinar I know that you run them which back then by the way was like back in the evergreen business system days it was like really new stuff and she said I hear you're doing really well with it can you give us some help so I started um, consulting on that with them. And then a little while later, um, Dan Kennedy and what is GKIC now actually hired our marketing agency to run all of their marketing for them. So we became their marketing department, really kind of outsourced marketing department. And then I really played the role of advising and guiding them on their marketing strategy from running traffic to member acquisition to member retention to filling events um, and uh, ascending people through membership into coaching and then mastermind groups. So um, we did that for a little up to um, what is now probably about a year ago since um, there'd been a new acquisition of GKIC. And before that, we'd ran the marketing for over 24 months. So, um, yeah, so there was a it was great to go from being the student to actually being the master, I suppose, and, uh, and helping uh, and Dan and uh, GKIC um, build their business. Um, and actually, weirdly, um, the, Dan Kennedy and GKIC weren't the only people that used, were my kind of mentors that we ended up helping. Uh, for those of you who know Jay Abraham and uh, Joe Polish and Joe hired me, um, really big. A component of what Joe does. Uh, Joe hired me to come in and, and, and consult with him on his Genius Network stuff. Other people like Josh Turner and Mike Kaling, people I've learned stuff from, ultimately ended up hiring our agency or me for consulting in some sort of capacity as well, which is which is rather cool. Ollie, I mean, that's that's an incredible resume. I'm just, I don't know about you, Jimmy, but that's got to be the one of the top three resumes the people we've had on we've had on a ton of guests so that's that's pretty incredible i'm just curious so you've built you know s several seven figure businesses you've helped build others um, you've seen others being built are there certain bedrock principles that every seven figure business has i mean is there a common trend among all the di all the different seven figure businesses 
Yeah, absolutely. It really boils down to four um, what I would call growth activators. Um, and I'd be happy to share them with you um, at a high level here. Um, the, the first is vision, because most businesses that are trying to grow from certainly six figures to, to seven figures, really up to from zero to, to six figures is a slightly different story. Um, but if we just focus on trying to move people from six to seven, um, the first is vision. So, you know, a lot of people think that they've heard of vision. They've probably read the books like, you know, Scaling Up or Rockefeller Habits or uh, Good to Great or, you know, a lot of the common books people read. And they're great books, don't get me wrong. Uh, but a lot of people, their feeling about them is that they're probably reserved for businesses that are a lot bigger than them. You know, they're probably reserved for businesses that are doing like five, 10, 20 million dollars in revenue and you know vision doesn't bring me any money it doesn't get me any leads clients or customers so you know why is that important and it's probably one of the biggest um actually probably one of the main in the first profit activator uh, because they need to really get clear on um the destination of where they're trying to go even why they exist in business for the first place because a lot of people get swept away with the daily um being in the weeds daily that they don't really raise themselves above that to thirty thousand foot and go why am i here why am i doing what i'm doing and um you know where are we going and so the, it's important to get clear on um, who you are, as in your values, and uh, that, that paves the way to help you with hiring and training and onboarding and firing a team as well. So getting the right people on the bus. Um, and then also the priorities, because as an entrepreneur, we can do all sorts of things every single day. And these days, there's loads of different things we could do to grow our business, but there's only so many things we should focus on. And so we need to get clear on our priorities, and then we need to have some sort of strategic plan on how we're going to achieve them. So every day when we wake up, we know in the next two weeks what we're looking to achieve. And then we're looking forward from that to this month, what our, our month looks like and what our quarter looks like and what our year looks like. And then how our year contributes to our three year plan. And so th there's a whole reverse engineering process around that that is actually a lot simpler than most people think but vision is the first one um and second then is building a growth team so once you've established where you're going what's the plan you then need to think about who not how so it's more about who is going to be there to help you and it's really about the fact that a lot of businesses have a lot of opportunity but their capabilities don't match their opportunity. And this is the reason why a lot of businesses, uh, probably practices and law practices are the same, is that they hit a growth ceiling or they, they sit and they stagnate and they stew in the same place because they, they know that there's an opportunity for them to grow. They know that they can get to seven figures and beyond perhaps um, or from multiple, from you know, early seven figures to multiple seven figures. But the thing that's stopping them is capability. And whenever you can get capability and opportunity to meet each other, then you will grow. And so that's uh, building a growth team is really about finding, hiring and training a team um, so that you as the entrepreneur are not trying to wear too many hats. Um, and there is a division of labor um, in terms of helping you get to where you want to be. So you get the right seats on the bus, as Jim Collins would have it. Um, and um, you train what we call a full stack modern marketing team, which, you know, as an umbrella comes under the word growth team. So there's people that are not just generalists. They are not just specialists, but they're actually generalizing specialists, which if, you, if you've been around digital marketing for a while, you will know that there's a convergence of lots of different parts of marketing that, that need to be understood in order for people to do their, their jobs well in, in different aspects. So we like this, this idea, this notion of creating a generalizing specialist, um, which uh, is a key component and a key pillar of building a growth team. And then the third um, growth activator to go from six to seven figures is in having an inbound selling system. And most people don't 
um, you know, can, again, they can do lots of things to drive leads and customers and clients, but really you need to find a way to predictably drive qualified leads into sales appointments, really on autopilot to be the front end acquisition of bringing in new um, customers and clients every single day. So you need to find one traffic source, not multiple traffic sources, not doing blogging, not doing social media, not doing Google AdWords, not doing Facebook, just picking one and being able to um, put that into a conversion funnel and then one sales mechanism. So we call that the one to one to one ratio. So one traffic system, one conversion mechanism system and what uh, one sales mechanism so there is this dependable predictable way of moving people through from not knowing anything about you into new clients which as we all know is like the like the lifeblood of every business and we have a, a methodology for that called the phone funnel framework uh, which brings people from stole stone cold facebook adver advertising uh, which some people find hard to actually work for them um, into actually qualified sales consultation um, and so that's the third growth activator. And then the final one um, is called the automation playbook. And this is really where about now we've kind of got this flow of leads coming through to us and we've got a way to convert them into sales. Not everybody's going to buy when we want to actually sell to them. They'll buy when they're ready. So we need to have a, a playbook, uh, a way to be able to, to move everybody that's unconverted through into a system that nurtures people, that educates them, that builds a relationship with them, and um, then makes offers to them more dynamically at a point where they're ready to become a customer. And we call it building an automation playbook, which is our approach to doing it. Um, and then, of course, once we do get a customer from the inbound selling system, we need to follow them up to wow them and delight them as a new customer uh, so that they will continue to, to spend money with us and maybe make a second or third purchase or retain us in some way. Um, or alternatively, they will refer us to friends, family and colleagues. And so those are the, the, the four growth activators, vision, building a growth team, an inbound selling system, and the automation playbook. Ollie, that was great. There's a lot in there that I, I uh, understand and appreciate. I, I really like the point you made about sometimes our, or a lot of times our capabilities don't uh, match our opportunities, and I think that's a real important point. Talk to us a little bit about that, if you could, a little bit more, and also why do you think it's important to focus on one traffic system, one conversion system, and one sales system? What 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 are you trying to help us understand there? Yeah, sure. So um, if we talk about opportunity versus capability, um, right now we're experiencing probably one of the most profound shifts in the history of running any business. Um, and that's really the fact that the, the, we're not short on any level of opportunity. I believe that every business, regardless of where they are right now, has a an opportunity to achieve double digit profitable growth year on year, or even quadruple, uh, uh, triple or even quadruple growth year on year. But where people get hung up is in um, really focusing in on the the things that are going to actually move their business forward they often get distracted um and even if they do find the things that they should focus on um then they realize that there is uh, there's a lack of capabilities there's a lack of skills to be able to enable them to do what they need to do and so i used to be a bit because of our agency you know, that was really where we came in. You know, we were the people people would hire to essentially enable them to um, uh, to to substitute what capabilities they didn't have by bringing in our agency. But my thought on that really is really only reserved now for businesses that are sort of eight figures or more that they should bring in an agency. I actually believe that businesses between six and seven figures and even early seven figures, if they want to build a real business, and by real, I mean one that works without them, then they should build their own in-house capability. They should build their own team. And nobody really wants to hear that they have to build their own team. Um, but 
the, the, the actual stark reality of this is you need to have those capabilities and those capabilities shouldn't be external capabilities. They should be internal capabilities because the best businesses in the world have teams inside of them, um, teams that generate leads, teams that generate sales, teams that create happy customers. Um, they're not agencies. And that might come as a bit of a surprise to a lot of people because it kind of goes against, you know, the reason why a business, you know, an agency may exist to help people. But if you're having, if you're a six figure law practice and you're having a, somebody run your Facebook ads, it's just abdication. Like you're, <laughs> you, it's not even effective delegation. Um, it's just the fact that you don't want to learn a skill. You don't want to bring in that capability to be able to match your opportunity. Um, and so, you know, that's a big mistake uh, that a lot of people make. Um, when I look back to my businesses and, and, and doing this five times over, I actually, I actually took a long time for me to work this out, that what was it that enabled me to do it so quickly? And I actually look at it and go, yeah, you know what? I did try and hire some agencies, but I came away from that quickly. Why did that happen? And then I sort of realized that, no, actually, I already... I know that to build a real business, I need to bring in real capabilities. And I, that means I'm going to have to build a team. So that's what I did. And, and that was really the rocket fuel that allowed me to, to, to scale very quickly. So um, that that's kind of the piece on the opportunity and capability piece. And then on the power of the, the one the one funnel, um, the one uh, mechanism, and the power of one to one to one is is the fact that I mean, there are just so many people I speak to that are talking to me about um, what they're going to do, and every time I speak to different people and I hear that they're either going to do something or they're doing something new, that really tells me how successful they're probably being because. The best businesses in the world, they have, you know, they, they found something that works and they rinse and repeat and they scale it. So many small businesses get distracted by either trying to find that thing or when they do find something that works, they don't continue to keep pulling that growth lever over and over and over and over again. And so they don't really end up with a machine. Um, and I look at sales acquisition um which is only part of running a successful business um it's a very important part but only part of running a business as a machine and i need to create a machine and i've got if i've got more than one machine to service then that i'm going to need more people to try and service the machine to find out where things are broken and where we need to iterate and where we need to improve and where we need to customize and where we need to personalize and everything else whereas if all my focus is on one thing then, you know, not only is it working, but I can oil the cogs where I need to. Um, I can add a few more cogs to it if I really need to do that too. And it's all based on a feedback loop of clients. So if my machine's not creating the clients that I want, like I'm getting clients, but they're not the sort of clients I need, I listen to the feedback and then I change the input, continue to iterate. But really, it's the same machine. Um, and that's just something that people. Um, I don't know why, but um, they come to you as an agency. I know we used to hear it all the time and they'd be like, hey, so really what I need to do is um, I need to like write content and I need to post regularly on social media and I need to do all of these things. You don't. It's as simple as that. Jim, I don't know about you, but I think what Ollie's giving us is just gold. I mean, this is really, really good. Um, so, Ollie, I, I've, I've got so many questions for you, but I've, we've only got a limited amount of time. So I'm going to ask you this one. So we, the people that listen to this podcast, they they also consume a lot of books. They consume other podcasts. We we get this advice all the freaking time about a variety of things. So are there certain things out there that are myths or that are just flat out wrong that people – continually repeat they say you should do this you should do that and you just mentioned kind of like you know produce content put it on social media are there other uh, examples of things that we should stop doing and, and the, because they're just being perpetuated out there saying that we need to do them that we shouldn't actually be doing well i think there's it, it depends on what phase of business that you're in um and as you grow there's things that become more 
um, prevalent than uh, in, in other phases of growth. So, for example, if you build a wildly successful practice, for example, um, you know, and you're not posting anything on social media at all, then people might come to believe that what you are, um, even though you are wildly successful, that there's no real proof of who you are um, from from people that may be, you know, con considering uh, hiring you. There's nothing else there other than that machine. And that's it. Um, and sometimes you have to balance that a little bit with the, the very fact that of the age that we're in. What I'm really talking about is is if, if there are things that you can do that can be that, that take you know less work to do than um, and, and that that kind of go with these other supporting strategies, that's fine. But there still needs to be one conversion point, uh, one conversion machine that you're looking at. So let me give you an example. So instead of like hiring a content writer or hiring an agency to do content or, you know, doing all of these micro pieces of free content out there, um, you know, th what I'm saying is, is that's fine. But is there a way to create a, a process whereby we could make something and then it like it, 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 it sort of syndicates itself? out into the ether and we're not expecting that um to really get anything back from it but any any entry point is only into the machine so for example if you are the owner of a law practice and you want to do content okay well that's fine um but you've got a machine so you've got what we call you know the phone funnel framework you've got the phone funnel framework in your business that's your machine that's your one mechanism um, you could record a video, which could be 20 minutes, just a selfie video on your phone. You put that into YouTube. It Then you could just have an assistant go and have it transcribed from Rev. And then they can go and post that on your blog and it embed the YouTube video. And then on the blog, there's only one thing that anybody can ever do that, that goes into the phone funnel framework. So there's only one entry point for that. And now you've got something on YouTube, you've got something YouTube embedded on your blog, you've got a transcript of the thing that they've read as well, and then you've got any downloaded or resources that you can give them that your admin can put in there. And then you've got your email list, you've got your customers, and you've got your unconverted leads. So somebody, every week, they go and send uh, an email out to that content. Now, when they see that content, then, of course, then there's only one entry point from there on to contact you with the phone funnel framework, which is great. That's what you what you want um and then the next day maybe on the wednesday if that was on the monday you can send another angle to that list again to the same content and so i'm saying some of these things on the periphery of all this it is useful um but just don't depend upon them as like oh i've got to get seo oh, i've got to kind of like get all this keyword rich stuff i've got to Listen, I, I've spent thousands and thousands of dollars on, on SEO. Um, I, I just and, and we've done it for clients and other things like that. The, what I'm explaining here is like, how do we get maximum results from minimum input that anything with anything that's nothing uh, that isn't directly related to the machine um, that's actually getting us customers? So that's kind of what I mean by that. And then I guess the falsehoods that we're told is honestly, and I think that this is quite a high level one but that you have to work 80 to 100 hours a week to be successful. You have to hustle and grind and um, have, you know, do lots of activity to be successful. Um, you absolutely don't. Um, I personally believe your business can achieve profitable growth without working more um, when you apply the right kind of growth activators to your business. Um, and so, you don't need to be doing all of these different things uh, to to get the results you need. Um, it's not about hustling and grinding. It's really just about focusing on the keeping the the, the main thing the main thing in in everything that you're doing. So I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, what drew me to your presentation at, at Traffic and Conversion was your discussion about putting on smaller events. And I really I really liked the way that you talked about doing it on a shoestring budget and you just sort of built a little following, not a little following, you built a following in America and you come, I know you come into like San Diego and other 
cities and you and you put on a presentation and people are able to interact with you. It's almost like a, a small mastermind. I was wondering if you could tell Tyson about that a little bit since he wasn't there and then just generally what as we as we grow our little group, we have um we have about a thousand people in our Facebook group. We we probably get about seven hundred downloads of our podcast each week. And um we had our first conference last year and we had seventy people come and right now we have about a hundred and thirty people signed up for the event in June. So I was just wondering what tips you might have for Tyson and I as we try to build out Maximum Lawyer. Sure. Well, um, I probably had a bit of a an advantage in the sense that I've we've been kind of the marketing powerhouse, I suppose, to supercharge a lot of other people's small events. Um, we had an idea, of course, what it is that we would do, but um, for ourselves, the intention was to bring people into a a small event between 35 and, 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 and 60 people or so. Um, and over the course of two days, really provide a lot of value and then ultimately make an offer to those people to sign up for my mastermind or to buy one of our uh, online programs. And um, we did that in a way which was a real positive experience. I think the key thing is to get really clear on what your intentions are from the beginning really beginning with the end in mind. For me, the experience of that event was very important to me because I've been to lots of events and they're just like a sales pitch and you've got multiple speakers and all of this kind of stuff. I didn't want any of that. Um, so I, I went into it with, um, okay, we want to sell these things and we want to provide a positive experience for, for those people that don't decide to continue the journey from us as well. So last year I ran four events in San Diego, in Austin, in Phoenix, and in Toronto. And we put people into the room by, uh, we had some in those areas, some people we had, uh, some, some cases we had a small list of people on our own house list. Um, but then mainly we bought small business data and we did direct mail. Um, we did two-step direct mail to them. We um, we followed people up that interacted with that that didn't buy a ticket with ringless voicemail, with text messaging, with multi-step multimedia approach and solid direct response principles uh, to attend the event. And the event was very clear. Like, as I was mentioning about your intentions, you also want to be able to set the scene for the people that are coming to the event of what's the big promise, what's the big idea, what's the hook that they're coming into? Like, why would they come? Um, why would they take time out of their, their business to come and attend this event um, as opposed to just sitting at home and not doing anything or just being inside their business? So obviously all the things cross through our minds at first. You know, how do we know we can attract enough people? What happens? You know, we don't really have a large list. Uh, what happens if we don't get people to show up? What happens if we don't make any money? All of this kind of stuff came through our mind. Um, but the the results were pretty astounding um, from 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 what we what we did because of the you know our approach and methodology to doing it. So our first event in San Diego, we only had 30 people in the room, and we generated um, ninety three thousand dollars in revenue and then $8,000 of monthly recurring revenue. Um, and then in Toronto, um, we had 50 people in the room, so a little more, and we sold $80,000 worth of sales, and then $14,000 of monthly recurring revenue, which was pretty good. Um, and then um, in Austin, we, um, we had, uh, it was about 90,000 again, and then in uh, Phoenix, um, this was kind of quite a big one. We generated $136,000 in revenue um, from people uh, coming into Mastermind with me, um, or buying our our program um, in some way. So um, it really was actually the cheapest acquisition of of, of new uh, students and customers for us um, from from doing this in the way that we did it. Um, and we invested up front, obviously, with direct mail and other things to get people in the room. But sometimes the most expensive people to get in the room are the best buyers. So they're actually the cheapest customers. Um, so, you know, we did it very affordably. I think even our first event, you know, um, we 
we really we really did do it on a shoestring budget we managed to do it without food and beverage we still wanted to maintain that great experience but we just really tried to um really get to a point where the cost of putting the event on was liquidated by the event ticket sales and all of these were like low tickets so they were only like 97 dollars to attend which you know everybody said i was crazy everybody said that you know it'd be impossible to 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 get to where we wanted to even we thought you know we haven't done anything like this for clients um exactly like this um but um it just goes to show you know just like everything else you know building a a really solid relationship with people over a period of days really gives you the proximity to allow people to see how they could continue the journey with you and how you could help them grow their business um and and that was certainly the case for us because we ended up you know having a fantastic mastermind group um from that and um also many people that joined our program as well so it really helped um and i positively endorse it for sure Ali, i'm curious a lot of the people listening to this podcast they're they're more you know b2c people they're not b2b people so do you think a lot of the principles that you use they can easily apply to B2C, B2C just as easily as B2B, right? I mean, I think a lot of people think, oh, well, he's he's selling to businesses, so it's different. A lot of these principles, they apply to both, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, are you are you um, asking from the perspective of if I was a law practice and I was selling B2C? Exactly. Yeah, we've used this um the, the same methodology, the same type of campaign to actually go out to even um, we've got a, a dermatological clinic as a as a client of ours. And, um, you know, they sell B2C and they are, you know, every single day working with people who are B2C and they're consumers. So and, and they adopted the same this approach had fantastic results with it if i was a law practice i'd be doing exactly the same thing um i would be putting these events on these small events on um and i, I wouldn't even i i would probably be thinking about doing them for half a day or maybe a day workshop of some sort um and providing good content you know some people might be thinking oh you know i've got to be out of the firm for a day or half a day that's going to cost x y and z but it's it, this is a, the best way to connect with people and people buy from people they certainly buy from people when there is proximity to those people as well and that's the thing that you can never really be able to come away from uh, and i would imagine from a law pr perspective uh, a practice perspective um depending upon the pains and the problems that people are having at that time um you know people probably would be in a position to say well i'm here i've listened to this right now this makes a lot of sense to me and you know, let's, you know, let's do it. I mean, you could even leverage your time by having people come into that particular workshop for say half a day or a day where it's kind of split up into sort of two hour slots or 90 minute slots that deal with specific parts or um, services of the law practice that, um, you know, maybe your law practice does lots of different things. They don't just do one particular, they're not one particular specialty. Um, and you could then invite people and almost showcase it as its own event, but just dealing specifically for that segment of people. Do a 90 minute presentation, make an offer to those people to, to obviously come and join the family or take advantage of something right there and then. And you're going to do well as a result of it. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what your day looks like? How do you manage running five companies, traveling all over and doing all these things? I know you have a lot of support because you've built out your capabilities, but how, how does your day look? Yeah, so um, a lot of it is governed by our strategic plan of, of what we're doing. And I kind of reverse engineer that back to um, even the day of me doing things and so i plan tomorrow today so at the end of every day i block out my time um just in a notebook i don't use any fancy software or anything um i know what the theme of that day is so i kind of do theme my days a little bit uh, where you know i'm doing 
um, sort of deep work, so to speak, for uh, three days of the week. And then two days of the week is kind of like multitasking or being in the office and doing different things where there's some schedule to the day and it's a little bit less, a little bit uh, more flexible. Um, but I'm working with other people in the business. Whereas like the other three days um, is really more about uh, planning the day into, I chunk it down into half an hour blocks. Um, and um, literally I start the day before and I start at 7 a.m. in the morning and I write 7 a.m. And then I'll do from 7 a.m. till half past seven, half past seven till eight, half past eight to nine. 9 till 9.30 and I'll go all of the way until my shutdown, which is around 6 o'clock um, every single day and plan that through. And then I will write next to each of those time blocks exactly what I'm doing in that time. And I'll start and start based upon that um, regime. Um, and uh, I turn my phone off, uh, put it onto flight safe mode. I don't turn it on until I do my breaks or at lunch. Turn Slack off, don't use that um and um just do the work this is great ollie so i do want to be respectful of your time we've we've taken more than what we even told you we were going to take so i, I do want to start to wrap it up before i do i want to remind everyone to go to the facebook group get involved there there's a lot of activity going on and if you don't mind taking a second and giving us a five-star review on itunes or wherever you get your podcast it really does help us spread the love i want to ask ollie i'm sure that you have piqued a lot of our members' interests, and I want to know what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? How do they start following you? What's the way to reach you? Sure. So um, I actually have some some training on these four growth activators, which I think people will get a lot of value from whether or not um, we decide to work together in any way, shape, or form in the future. Uh, but certainly something that would be kind of thought-provoking and, and would enable people to um, – just take things on a step from where they are. So um, if they go to uh, nextlevelbusiness.com, nextlevelbusiness.com forward slash learn. So nextlevelbusiness.com forward slash learn. Um, they will find that there is um, some on-demand training available there. It's not a webinar. It's a, it's a video. So you haven't got to, you know, sit through it and not be able to skip through the stuff. We don't do that sort of stuff. Um, but you can go there and you can learn about the uh, phone funnel framework as one of the growth activators. And in that video, I also explain about um, the other uh, three growth activators that we spoke about earlier on about growing from six to seven figures or seven figures to multiple seven figures. And you can go and get a 24 hour pass to go and watch that training uh, there. And um, and then uh, then if we can help you, um, then of course we will. And uh, the next step from then on is to have a, a free discovery call with us to find out how we can do that. So that's it, really. That's great. So for my hack of the week, this is a, something I heard on one of Pat Flynn's podcasts a while back, and that is to grab your iPhone or your Samsung, whatever, and look at your messages. Scroll down to the very bottom, as far down as as old as you can get on your messages, find people that you haven't connected with in a while, and just send them a quick text, letting them know that you're thinking about them, that you haven't you haven't reached out in a while, and that you just wanted to reconnect. I like that. That's very cool. Uh, very neat. Um, Ollie, I also want to plug your, your website, oliverbilson.com. You've got, you've got all your trainings there, or some of your trainings there. You may have them in other places, too. It's pretty cool. I mean, you've got a lot of really cool product. So I want to make sure people know about that. Um, for Before I get to my tip, uh, Ali, do you have a tip for us? I would, my tip's probably related to the training. Um, so sorry for the double plug um, on that. That's the, the best way for me to, best, best way for you to implement it is I strongly believe that the, you only need these four growth activators for you to achieve double digit, double digit profitable growth without working more to gain control of your business, maximize your opportunity with new capabilities and be able to get um, strong amounts of automation inside of your business. The best way to do that, and I've previously released that training um, as paid training, it's available for free. You can get a 24 hour pass around it is 
my tip is go and watch it and go and consume it and go and listen to every single word of it and decide that you're going to take action on it. Too many people want to listen to great content like this and lots of other of your other episodes, I'm sure, that have been fantastic. But they essentially want to just feel good about it. And honestly, you're not going to grow your business if you don't take action and you don't put yourself in a situation where it could be a bit uncomfortable to grow. So my tip is uh, go and take action. I love it. And we're all about the double plug. So don't worry about that, Ollie. That's, that's, it's good. Uh, for my tip of the week, it's actually, it's a pretty basic thing, but uh, I don't know, about two years ago, I started, started ordering from National Pen Company and people are always asking like, you know, where do you get your merchandise, things like that. They are awesome. Their customer service is amazing. And they also have high quality merchandise, pens, notebooks, things like that. And they're really inexpensive. So I highly recommend them, National Pen Company. Worst, worst case scenario is if you get on their mailing list, every two weeks they will send you a sample product in the mail. It, so I, I just got like a, a notebook in the mail from them. It, it, it's got, it's actually branded with my firm's information on it. And I get something every two weeks. So sometimes it's a pen, sometimes it's a screwdriver, it's a variety of things, but pretty cool. So I, I recommend checking it out. Ollie, thank you so much for coming on this. I actually can't wait to re-listen to this episode because it's it, there's a lot of great information and I'll check out your products. So thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks, guys. Have a good week. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your hosts and to access more content, more content. go to MaximumLawyer.com. Maximum Have a great week and catch you next time.